get ready. I mean, get ready, 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 ready. It's time to motivate, inspire, transform. Hand towards your future. Reach for the stars. Genesis of change. It's from within. When you learn to lead, everyone wins. I am really excited about today. We are truly blessed and honored to have my colleague, but most specifically my friend. Friends, yes. Friend <laughs> present today for what I call a master class on intentional leadership. So we want to sit back, relax, and enjoy this organic conversation between two friends, mm -hmm. two professionals, two individuals that are passionate about children and assuring that they have the best education possible. So let's get started. So Nadia, I'm going to do what you might not want me to do, but I have to talk about your accolades and all the things you've done prior to us getting started. So I'm going to take directly from her book, The Bridge to Brilliance, how one principle in a tough community is inspiring the world. And we'll talk about inspiring, we know about that. So Dr. Nadia Lopez is the founding principal of Mount Hall Bridges Academy in Brownsville, Brooklyn, a model for quality education that includes a safe, nurturing, and innovative learning environment. She has been profiled in countless national media outlets and has been invited to speak at Harvard and Yale and was invited to the White House and delivered a TED Talk on the revolution of education. She is a recipient of the 2015 Black Girls Rock Community Change Agent um, and she also is the top 50 finalist for the 2016 Global Teacher Prize. She's done multiple things since then and we are <laughs> honored and it's a pleasure to have you with us. Well, I'm just grateful to be here. It's been so long. Yes, so I'm, I'm excited. I am too. So let's get to let's it. Let's get it. Let's, let's go to it. So let's just talk about intentional leadership mm -hmm. and your definition, first of all, of a leader. Um, so for me, the, a leader is someone who doesn't require a title to do what's right. Um, a leader is someone who's willing to stand up um, and speak out, even when it makes others uncomfortable. Um, a leader is audacious and um, very much intentional about what they do. Um, but they're also understanding of the people that they serve. Mm -hmm. And that's often missing in leadership. Um, we get into a position and we fail to understand that there was a purpose before you got the power. And the power is never supposed to drive your leadership. It's supposed to be your purpose. Absolutely. So when you think about your purpose, mm -hmm. do you think it's associated with your passion? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, first and foremost, I'm a believer of God. And I know that I prayed for him to direct me in the work that I was supposed to do that was supposed to impact lives. So when I started out, after I went to college, I, you know, I thought I was going to be a nurse, but that wasn't what God had intended. What he wanted me to understand was the holistic approach to understanding people. Um, and that's what I've been able to apply as a teacher and then eventually as a leader, just understanding holistically the community, the needs of my staff, as well as the children I was gonna serve. So what I'm hearing is you were intentional in developing those relationships with your staff. Absolutely. And how do you think that impact, you know, how did that impact your students as far as their achievement, outcomes, and your community you were serving? When you treat people like human beings, they're willing to treat the children like human beings. So oftentimes we focus so much on social emotional support of the children, but I always say, what about the adults, mm. right? They have to come into work. We don't know what they're dealing with. And then there's also the vicarious trauma of dealing with children in poverty. Right. 
And before I'm a leader or was a principal, I had to remember that I was a mother. I'm somebody's child. Um, I know what it's like to be a divorcee. Um, I know what it's like to be a Brooklyn girl in the same community that my school was, you know, located in. And I'm a human being. And so I needed to bring that every single day into my workplace. And I really needed to respect my team and understanding that they were humans as well and that they had responsibilities. And so for me to ask them to serve, to do all that they can for children, I needed to make sure that I was doing the same for them. You mentioned the key word, serve. Yes. And we talk about this. We talked about this as uh, colleagues in Boston, the mm -hmm. new leaders, about yes. servant leadership. <laughs> yes. And what that looks like and how, how does that feel. Yes. So talk to me specifically about possibly a situation that you encountered with a staff member that um, you had to, you know, utilize your coaching strategies mm -hmm. and you had to be intentional about your methods to support those individuals? There's so many. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll use one in particular um, because it had to deal with a staff who was a black male um, and his family is not from this country per se. And oftentimes what you would hear and see is that as an immigrant, and I know this because my parents aren't from this country, my mother's from Guatemala, my dad is from Honduras, there's often this expectation that because children are in the United States and they should understand that education is like a priority. And that's not necessarily the case. Um, his belief, firm belief, was that children needed to be high proficiency. Right. And those were the kids that he was focused on. But I was like, but that's not the school community that right, we're in. Right. So we need to understand that our responsibility is to really understand this community and understanding what the needs are of these children. They did not wake up wanting to be impoverished. They didn't wake up wanting to fail. They didn't wake up wanting to be destitute. They woke up this morning coming into the school expecting us as adults to be here for them, right. to nurture them. And they're adolescents, right? So they're gonna go through all of the drama that they, we went through and we forget about when we become adults. And so I had to remind him of the fact that, and he was from Haiti, so I wanna be transparent about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And what I said to him is that this world looks upon Haiti, prior to anybody was saying anything negative in the news, right, as, sub, as substandard. And growing up, I remember young people from Haiti, my peers, who never wanted to say they were from that country because they were ashamed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do you then do the same thing to a child who comes in here? The same way that you look down at, on Brownsville is the same way people look down on Haiti. So I need you to have some compassion and empathy, right? Because you're a brilliant man. There are brilliant children in this room. Someone believed in you and poured into you, so you have a responsibility to do the same. That same child that you feel like isn't proficient may not be proficient right now, but you're going to deposit some type of seed into them, right? And you're going to help them realize that they can be more than what anybody else says. He took that back, and then he processed. And I remember um, it was also at a time that a child had... He, he was in a gang and they didn't have a good relationship and he felt threatened by this child. And I'm like, he wasn't going to do anything to you. But he felt the need to, to, to show his power. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, because the child made a threat, he did get suspended. And then when he came back to school, I remember saying to him, so he's going to go on this college visit with me to Vassar College. And he was like, I don't think he deserves it. I said, I didn't ask what you think. Mm. I'm just letting you know he won't be in class today because right, he's right. going on this trip. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because of that child going on that trip, he came back and said to that same teacher, when can I come in to make, it, make up all my work? And he thought I, you know, the child was joking. He said, I'll be here at 7.30. If you make it, you make it. The child was there every day at 7.30. He made up all his work. 
the same gang members who he was running with, because he was actually one of the leaders, mm -hmm. they would come to the classroom at the end of the day knocking at the door, because he, he would come in the morning and he would stay in the evening as well, and say, yo, man, let's go. And he was like, I got work to do. I'll see y'all when I see y'all. That same teacher came back to me and said, I apologize for not believing in that child. And I recognize and see how much he was willing to change, so I need to do the same. And so my responsibility as a leader was to, in that moment, still serve him mm -hmm. as an adult, mm -hmm. right? Not judge him, but help him recognize that someone will judge you. And how do we change that around? And from that time, he has been my best teacher. And when I transitioned, he remained at the school. Well, it's so many nuggets in there. And I'm going to kind of dissect several key things mm -hmm. that you, you stated as it relates to the modeling you did for him. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you, based on my cultural sensitivity mm -hmm. for this child and my awareness, the relationship that I've built with this child, yes. that's something that you need to do. Yes, it's absolutely. To develop, develop that type of relationship and understand, you know, the cultural background of this child, his exposure and experience. Now, let's, let's, yes. let's, talk, let's talk about that nugget, experience and exposure. Yes. The trip mm -hmm. was the catalyst for the change. Yes. Absolutely. The opportunity. Absolutely. And it's throughout your book. That is your mission. And you talk about that constantly about exposing our students. And you know, you and I have always, it's mm -hmm. a passion mm -hmm. for myself and you, the urban school settings, mm -hmm. the ones that they say can't excel yes. or achieve. And Absolutely. we know that's not so. But you provide, you provide that young man an opportunity where he was able to see that I can change, I can shift my trajectory. Because prior to that trip, I want you all to understand, his mother was a drug addict. And she would come into the meetings literally nodding. So you could tell who the adult was in the room, right? And his brother was also a leader of the gang. So he had a high position. So he was just following his brother's footsteps. He knew nothing else. He never left the neighborhood. So for him... My school is here. The projects that I live in is right next door to my school. The zone high school is not too far from the school. And we have a prison, a juvenile detention center that's right in the neighborhood as well. So it was a pipeline for him. Once I took him out of that very neighborhood and I, and you know, I, I describe it in the book. And when I tell you I have stories for days, so that's why I want to keep it on track with the book. <laughs> right. I remember him just sitting and looking out the window and staring at the grassy knoll and looking at like, he was just like, what, like there's cows here. And I was like, yeah, because I have traveled, because I've gone up north, I don't, you know, it's nothing for me, but to watch a child just glue to the window. And he was just like, people live here, yes. Then we get to the campus. You know, kids get really excited when they see free food at the campus. That, that's the tie-in, right? They, they're like, you get to choose whatever you want. No one's, right. no one's gonna tell you right. you can't right. eat a lot, right? Because right? for them, free free, you could only get one tray and all these things. They was like, wait, you, you, I, could, I have selection? I was like, yeah, absolutely. Then we went by the dorms. He was like, people sleep here? I said, yes. You get a dorm, you get to sleep here. And for him, it was a sense of peace. He had never experienced that. He had never experienced where there weren't adults constantly on you, on you, on you, on you, telling you that you weren't going to be anything. This was clearly an institution that said, we know you can learn and succeed. He said to me, how do I get here? And that's how he ended up going to the teacher. I didn't go to the teacher. He said, what do I need to make up all my work? So if we take the time to expose them to what their possibilities are, because somebody did it for us. If we take the time to have conversations and even just asking the question, how are you? Did you eat today? What did you do this weekend? Who do you get to talk to? What do you need me to do to help you so that you can do better in class? What is your distraction?
There's so much that children will tell you, but we never ask those questions. We simply say, you need to get this done. You didn't get this done. Where's your mother? I need to call, like all of the negative things. We reinforce the very things that society has already told us from the time we are born. We are never going to be good enough. And we don't recognize it because as adults, we feel like because we're calling the parent, it's gonna make things better. The parent is often not equipped. The parent takes it as a reflection of you're telling me my child isn't good enough. Because every time you're calling me to tell me that my child isn't doing well, I essentially was a bad parent that sent this child mm -hmm. to the school. Mm -hmm. right. And then that parent wants to tear that child up because I didn't send you to the play and you're embarrassing me. So all they know is I'm not good enough. I think when I think about, you know, children and how impactful we as leaders are mm -hmm. and how we bring a lot of things from home. Yes. With us to work on a day to day basis. Uh, some things that we even were experiencing was exposed to even in our younger days. Mm -hmm. Some good, some not so good. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about a time, you know, and I know you and I have talked a little bit about this, about a time when you just, you know, had to really dig in deep as a leader to just walk through the door one more time. That was like every day, mm -hmm. right? Poverty, I experienced it. But when you're in a school and you have so many children, that vicarious trauma is a trigger. And people who have never been in poverty don't understand that. There are things that you bury that you don't want to ever relive, but through this child, a child who's also broken, who doesn't understand mm -hmm. that so they're actually engaging in a vicious cycle, they know how to push your buttons. They know how to say certain things, right? And you're like, I want to be here to help you. But what we're really saying is I'm trying to save my younger self. Mm. Wow. And that's part of the hard work that we have to recognize we haven't healed ourselves. We can't keep healing other children if we haven't healed the child within us, right? And so every day, and I did not know that every day I was reliving trauma and I hadn't healed myself. I was trying to help everybody else. So one of the things that I did was I had a mental health provider at the school because I knew how my kids got down. They knew how to push. And you keep pushing an adult. If you at home with your own kids, you know how to just, you know, <laughs> lean in real tight. You can't, and you can't get too close, no, right? No. So I have to remind my staff time and time again, I was like, so it's called corporate punishment. If you touch a child, if you mm -hmm. say something that's not right. So I had to get a mental health provider from day one. I knew that because they can get set off and one mistake will cost them their license. One word will cost them their license. And I'm like, you're not their mother. Their mm -hmm. mother could cuss them to whatever mm -hmm. they want to, mm -hmm. but you cannot do it. Is it right? No, but I need you to save yourself and your right. job. Right. And so for me, um, the difficulties was, the difficulties were, I wasn't just dealing with children and their trauma, I was dealing with parents and their trauma. Yes. And what people fail to understand is that parents want the very best for their children, but they do feel like a lack of, in, they, have, they have tremendous insecurities. And because you represent the thing that they would want, sometimes they don't even know how to engage with you mm -hmm. because they think that you think that you're better than them. And you have to remind them, I'm here to serve you. I love your child. I'm just grateful that you chose me to be that educator Absolutely. in their life, right? I've had to do that. I had mothers come in, taking off their earrings, like bagged down, about to fight me. And I was like... <laughs> Right. Like, I literally was in my office, and this mother was like, so I just need, and I was just like, where is she, what is she doing, right? right. And, and let me tell you what, what, how it transpired was because the scholar had asked me how many children I had, right? I said, baby girl, I got 
one child and a dog. <laughs> I can't have more because ACS would be at my house. I can't even give time to the ones I have, right? So I can't do it. Right. She went home and told her parent that I said that ACS would come to her house because she had too many kids. <laughs> oh, wow. How she took what I said, yeah. right? <laughs> so me and her mama, we had a good relationship until the mom came in my office with her bag, put the bag down, started to proceed to take her earrings off and was like, so I just need you to know that you said something about ACS. And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, well, my daughter came home and said that you said I had too many kids. I said, that's not what I did. <laughs> I literally had to take the child out of class and I said, I need you to explain what I said, step by step. And by the time we were done, the mother was like, <laughs> oh, girl, you know. <laughs> and I just, I was so confused because I said, so where were we supposed to go with this? And here's the thing. That mom felt comfortable enough to do that because she probably had engaged with another educator who was like, uh-huh, girl, let's go. And I was just like, I'm not... I have too much to lose. Right, right. And I recognize you're hurt. I recognize that you feel like someone is judging you because you have a lot more children. I just don't have time to have more children. That became one of my best parents. It, it, it truly is the relationship and getting to know the parent. Absolutely. And the art of listening, which I am honestly <laughs> still a work in progress. You have to connect mm -hmm. with the parents, yes. your teachers, and your students as the leaders. And then, too, what I heard was, as a professional, yes. you have to learn, sometimes you have to just step back without reacting. Because now you could have, you could have. I could have. But what, what was that going to do for us? And then after, when some time passed, I had to... I had to come back to it and I said to the mother, I cannot explain to my daughter how I ended up in jail and how I lost my job mm -hmm. off of what, right? But again, when people live in poverty and they're surrounded by family members who are incarcerated, there's nothing for them to lose. So I have to redirect and say to her, they could take your kids. And then the mother was like, I didn't think about that. I know you did because you wouldn't have been here. Right. And so it's not for me to judge. It's for me to learn and understand. And that's often the pro problem. Media will say or perpetuate the images of us fighting. And I would hear phrases that I know an 11 year old should not be saying to right. me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not a factor. And I was like, the hand. Why do you know that? But their moms are watching it. Their sisters are watching it. Everybody's watching it. Mm -hmm. And so for me to be like, you shouldn't be watching it, I'm passing judgment. What I have to say is, baby girl, every time you watch that and then you behave that way, that's why people think that we're savages. Is that who you want people to perceive you as? Because as a black woman, I don't want to be looked at as someone who can't have a conversation without keeping my hands to myself. So we're constantly uh, teaching. Oh, you, all you, the time. You, not only did you educate <laughs> the parent, you're educating yes. the, 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 the child how to respond to certain situations. Absolutely. Or what have you. And I think it's important as well as, as a leader to yes. be intentional about modeling those, those expectations, how to problem solve, how to uh, resolve conflict, mm -hmm. you know, um, especially when it comes to parents that are, are, are upset, which is a, a lot in our, in our work. It, it is. Yeah. Um, so I told you that I, I started out in my world of nursing. So nursing helped me to be an active listener, mm -hmm. right? And that was the one thing I learned about being a nurse versus the wanting to be a doctor because the doctor is so focused on diagnoses and how to treat the diagnoses. The nurse is focused on behaviors that led you to that and wants to t educate you on how to become better, right? So we serve in the capacity of wellness. And so I've always understood that you have to be in a position of educating and just speaking to people because we have a natural belief that everyone should know things and they don't. You know what I mean? I know that my parents had a limited education, if you ask my mother something in Spanish and you ask her something about 
things that happened way back in the day, she can answer those questions. If you ask her about things right now and you ask her in English, it takes her a longer time to process. Somebody's going to think that my mom doesn't have the capacity. If I say it in Spanish and I translate it for her, they was like, oh, but you didn't understand what her needs mm. were. So I'm not going to assume that you know everything. I'm going to meet you where you're at so that you feel comfortable, but you also know that I'm here in service. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's, let's, let's talk about the students. Yes. One in particular, the young man that really was a catalyst for you, you know. Uh, oh, Vidal. A, yes. Mm -hmm. Kind of share with us about that experience um, and the pla now the platform that you are currently on and how you are now utilizing that to adv advance your mission. Humans of New York was a godsend. I want to be very clear and transparent. I wanted to quit. I had my laptop out. I was writing my letter of resignation because I was burnt out. I had not gotten support as a leader. I was doing everything for everyone else, and I had been asking for help. But part of the problem is that when we are in a position of leadership and we really are invested, we become superheroes. Literally, we never take off the cape. And so I recognized that the school wasn't where it needed to be because I was tired and I, I didn't have support. I didn't have, um, I had just got on board an assistant principal. I had been doing everything, professional development, evaluations, everything from year one recruitment, everything. And so I, I just wanted to tap out. Um, the next day, I went to the school to drop my daughter off to go out with, go um, hang out with the basketball team. It was pouring. Someone didn't come with an extra car to drive the basketball players. I'm like, I'm going to church because now I'm going to pray. <laughs> my daughter said, you going to let them stand in the rain? I said, listen, it's Sunday. She was like, so at that point, when she looked at me, I was like, you know, she was like, you would never say that. I was like, oh, God. So I take the children. We go, you know, it's three cars. They lose. I looked at them. I was like, and y'all lost the game. <laughs> so now I'm even more upset. So the next day is Martin Luther King Day. And I agreed to keep the door open for, I agreed to open the school for a leadership program for young people. And it was 300 young people that weren't necessarily from my school coming in. It was 25 degrees, there was black ice everywhere. I literally was ice skating my way to work. And I was so angry at this point, because now I'm like, I never say no, I'm so tired. So I sat in my office and I was like, God, I apologize for being angry. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing, but if this is it, Lord, mm. I know I'm supposed to walk in faith, but I just need you to send me a sign. So I know that I'm supposed to stay here because I'm tired and I'm ready to go. I said that at 7.30 in the morning. So all of a sudden, I found this. I found that the day went smooth. It was a really, really good day. I see, like, multiple people are texting me, but one of my scholars had texted me. Um, and he had graduated, and he said, this is you. Look at what you've done. And I'm like, Marquise, what? Like, what is Marquise talking about? So I click the link, and then I see the response, I see all the likes, I'm starting to see the comments, then I, other teachers are texting me and I'm like, so I start literally crying. And so my daughter says, and, and she was so young cause now she's gonna be 20. So she was like 14, 13, 14. She was like, mommy, I think we just need to go to the car. Cause I don't think you're gonna be able to handle the rest of the show. Mm -hmm. So we go into the car and I start bawling even more. Cause I was like, why would he even think that much of me? when I didn't think about myself like that. I didn't think that I mattered. I didn't think that there was a sense of purpose anymore. And so I go home and I show my mother. My mother did not understand Facebook. She kept pressing, it kept reloading. I was like, I just need you not to just scroll up, right? And as she's reading each one of the comments, she says to me, you see how God answers prayers? Mm -hmm. you're supposed to be exactly where you're at. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> right, you're right. 
Um, and I was grateful. I was grateful. However, I was still tired. I was still tired and it didn't make it easier. And I want to be transparent about that Mm -hmm. because it leads to where I am today. Yes. Because now I got notoriety, everyone said, she good because we got money. The money wasn't for me. She good would have been a chauffeur, a chef (laughs) and a nanny. I didn't get any of those things. The money went towards children going to college going to um, getting scholarships and summer programming. That's all the money covered. It didn't cover books. It didn't cover anything else. It covered these three things that we had agreed upon. Now there was a microscope on me. Because the haters are going to hate. She don't even be doing that much. Wow. You've never been in my building, (laughs) right? Right. But you're also mad because a child says something about me that I didn't have to pay him to say. Mm. He was found on the street and I had prayed to God to send the message and make it clear about what I wanted to what I needed to do because I was done. Clearly, you don't put children first because a child would have said something about you. Right. But I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> so here we are. And I'm feeling the angst of now I'm having to answer questions. So even the media, and no one prepares you for how to deal with the media. But a little tip I did learn from America's Top Model Mm. about how to deflect questions. But it was important because they would ask me, why do you call them scholars if they they don't show any scholarly uh, behaviors? How do you decide that, um, how do you talk so highly about them when you look at their test scores? And so they were trying to remind me that my kids weren't good enough. And so I had to lean in and I said, I call them what I do because I am the principal and I created the school. Mm. So respect that. Right. And then I told them, are you not going to the elementary schools and asking the questions about why they don't have the professional development or support? And where's the superintendent that's supposed to make sure that when they come to me in middle school, I'm not struggling. Y'all not having these conversations. They intentionally do this to us in these communities of color. So y'all not asking the right questions, but you like to write the report and the article that will then chastise me. No, that's not going to happen. So I found myself always trying to protect my staff, protect my scholars. And so I ran myself ragged. So my first autoimmune disease was esophilic esophagitis. Literally, because of the acid going up and down my esophagus, my white blood cells felt like my esophagus was a foreign body. So it starts to attack it. Wow. I would have to go to the ER for them to give me liquid lidocaine just to stop the peristalsis, right? Nobody's there with me in the hospital to deal with that. And then I needed to take time off and the doctors was like, we don't know how long you're going to last. I don't want to sign your death certificate. So the time that I wanted to take off, Immediately, they told me your assistant principal isn't tenured. If she goes in your position and something happens, she will be reverted back to a teacher. She can never be a principal or an assistant principal. So now the pressure's on me. I couldn't think about myself. I thought about all the times that she had my back when I had to travel, when I had to do this, I had to do that. So I stayed. And as God would have it, 2018 to 2019, she got her tenure. Right. It was December 2018, May 2019. I got sick. And so I developed Berger syndrome, which is IgA nephropathy, which is an autoimmune disease that attacks your kidneys. First off, people of color don't get this disease. It's very rare. But it was because of the stress of the work and internalizing everything, not going to the bathroom, not drinking enough water, drinking coffee all day. Right. I need to keep up, I need to keep up. Not eating meals, not sleeping, because I was paranoid. I developed anxiety, I had depression. Because you have the anxiety of what next? Then you have the depression of, oh God, I haven't done enough. So it's like a yo-yo effect. And you're internalizing and all of that energy. And I got sick. So even with that, and mm-hmm. and, and we're, we're, I could talk to you all day long. <laughs> but even with that, we have to be intentional. Yes. 
And we talk about, I don't say work-life balance anymore. Mm -hmm. I say work-life integration. Mm -hmm. yep. And you had to make that change. Yes, absolutely. There are three things that I want to ask you as a wrap-up. Mm -hmm. And I have one question from the audi an audience member that I, I felt was really, really, really good um, that I want to ask you. Okay. But as I wrap up, I want to ask you, what motivates Nadia? There's three things. The first is my purpose that I know God um, trusts me with his vision. So that motivates me. The second thing, my daughter, like hands down, as a woman of color, um, as someone who had to go from leadership and then become an entrepreneur and redefine what it means to lead and how to do those things, I wanna always remind her she doesn't have to settle. She doesn't have to sacrifice herself. She can choose. And the first thing she needs to choose is her. But what also motivates me is mankind and humanity. I just, it's, you know, sometimes we wake up and say there's not enough humanity in the world, there's a loss of hope, but hope is within each and every one of us. And my mother taught me that every time she told me to pray. And so I have a responsibility as a human being to want to add value into this world. And so I have to go back to number one and trust and pray to God that he will give me the answer of what I'm supposed to do and I, how I can lead in his favor. So how do you inspire others? I, I honestly believe it's just my authenticity. I don't, I don't choose and sit down and be like, so I'm <laughs> going to inspire people. I don't, I don't think that that's the case. I think that inspiration comes from me willing to tell my story. I'm not ashamed of anything that I've been through. I believe you should speak your own truth before somebody creates the narrative for it. And whatever you've been through was by design. Because you can't say that you're still standing unless you've gone through something. And when we show shame in that, people will try to pick it apart and, and, and bring you down, which is why I would always tell my children, it don't matter if you poor. It don't matter where you come from. You got to define what poor looks like, baby. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. But speak into existence what you want to see on the other side of it. And so that's how I live my life. And, you know, for, for the most part, people are like, thank you for sharing. Because especially in this work, for whatever reason, the system is designed for us not to ever speak about what we go through. And so when we do, people are like, they, they make us feel bad for telling our truth. Education is hard. It's hard work. <laughs> it is. It's hard. And yes, it's a calling, but at sometimes you don't want that, the, you don't want to pick up the phone, mm -hmm. right? You are ready to say, I need a new carrier, Jesus. I need you to take me somewhere else. But... I know that he said, I need you to show what children can be. And I need you to speak on behalf of the adults who are working hard and showing them, showing the world that we cannot longer live in silence. And I'm like, so there's some st stuff that we still have that needs to be worked on. So. That's how I use my platform now, to tell the truth. And my final question, how have you transformed? Whew. I give myself grace. I didn't do that before. Um, I choose me. I didn't do that before. <laughs> I go to therapy. Um, I take care of myself. I've changed how I eat. I make sure I eat, you know, multiple times a day. I strive to, to experience joy and I no longer want to be a superhero or live a life of a martyr because that's not, that's not it. Um, but it comes with a mindset change as well because I will say this, that 
we believe that the place that we're at is the end all be all because we live in a scarcity mindset because that's what we've been taught. So to say, I don't, I need a minute would mean that you're weak. I call that courageous to know where you are, to pause and say no, or I need time. You have that God given right. Wonderful. I would like to end this podcast by, first of all, thanking you for a wonderful conversation and dialogue. Thank you. I feel like Oprah, everybody gets a copy of the book. (laughs) And I want you all to know that as the end of this broadcast, I want you to remember that. And you you really said something key. It's a shift and a change in mindset. Yes. And understand that the genesis of change, it begins from... Within. within absolutely thank you all for being here being so attentive and let's give her a round of applause for a wonderful <laughs> masterclass thank you thank you <laughs>